All right, welcome back one more time. This time we're going to be looking at A1 and uh, just trying to give you some strategies in order to how to unpack sources, find those nuances, see how they connect to liberalism, see how they connect to some of the other themes of the course, like the relationship between government and governed. This is a Prezi that I have. So if you go to Google and type in uh, McBride Prezi, source interpretation or McBride Prezi A1, this should come up. But I figured why not make a video of me going through it with you. So please uh, excuse some of the dramatics. It's going to flip around a little bit because I probably was bored when I made it. So 20% of the diploma is one assignment. Do you know how to do it? How to respond to source interpretation question. So here's some sample sources. There's a sample cartoon. Here's a second sample source. And there's a third sample source. So responding to the source, interpreting the source. Step one, it's always important to, at least in your own mind, figure out well, what's on the page. Take a moment, take a look, see what's on the page. So for example, source one is a political cartoon that depicts a presumably Muslim woman covered head to toe in a burqa. What's on the page? So although nowhere in the rubric does it say description of source, uh, by describing the source, it, it forces you to look at the elements within the source, the details within the source should, that should unpack the perspective of the source. Step two, what are the key related themes, terms, principles, connect that to liberalism? So for a list of some of the terms related to the conceptual summary of Social 31. So politically, look for connections to the principles of liberalism, uh, individual rights and freedoms, rule of law, political equality, civil liberties, citizen participation. To what extent uh, is it either reflecting or rejecting these principles? We need to have statements that are directly connected to that. You know, is the source rejecting civil liberties? Because it's pointing out some kind of uh, limitation in terms of the rational thinking of, of mankind. Is it rejecting citizen participation because it's suggesting that as um, voters we vote emotionally and not rationally? Uh, you know, what is it doing? So this is where you can connect the source after you've done step one, what's on the page. Now, now you're starting to look at, you know, why is it on the page, right? Why is it on the page? Connecting it to liberalism. And while you connect it to liberalism, you should be able to see a problem that they see in society. What is the problem that is limiting our lives? What is the obstacle in the way of us having a more fulfilled life? And what is the solution to that obstacle? And ultimately, the solution that they present should be connected to some of these values of either individualism or collectivism. And the solution to the obstacle that we can infer from the source, that solution is the ideological perspective. And with this solution comes values and assumptions that you can then further unpack. So it could be a rejection of liberalism. It uh, could be promoting state control, could be promoting law and order, could be promoting state security, could be promoting service or obedience to the state. Maybe it's partial or temporary. Maybe the removal or rejection is associated with some kind of empty democracy, like an illiberal democracy. Or maybe it's suggesting that we need a total or permanent rejection because we'd rather have an authoritarian state. So many of the fascist dictators um, or fascist philosophers like Gentile and Schopenhauer and Sorrell would say that in order to have fulfilled lives, we must submit to the will of the state. Mussolini, everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. That would be a rejection of individualism and liberalism, a reflection of non-liberalism, because it's suggesting that our primary purpose as citizens is service to the community, not a promotion of self-interest, but more so a promotion of collective interest. So, for example, for source three, the topic or theme is political liberalism. 
More specifically, the key terms are civil liberties and individual rights and freedoms. Step three, does the source reflect or reject liberalism? How can we tell? We can also consider the intended response. Now, what's the intended audience? And what perspective on the issue does the presenter want the audience to take? This is where we can talk about things like the intended appeal of the source. Do we want the reader, do we want the viewer to have an emotional connection to elements within the source? And what connections within that source? What elements is it? Is it a small child that we're supposed to take an interest in the well-being of and then think more compassionately towards economic cooperation? Is there some kind of logical appeal? Are they trying to create a logical argument? Because of this and this and this, we need this. Because COVID-19 is airborne. Um, because we have to reopen schools, it's logical we should have masks. Like Things like that. Just seems logical. Or is there an ethical line that they're appealing to in the source? Is it playing on our ethics? Are they trying to determine what is correct, what is right, what is just, what is moral, what is what should be a foundation, a pillar, a cornerstone of society? Are they trying to promote or present a, a new basis of ethics? Also consider the tone. So not only consider the appeal to the viewer, consider the tone of the source. Is the, t is the source being sarcastic? Are they presenting information in a sarcastic way, a cynical way, a satirical way, an optimistic way, a humorous way, an informative way, a liberal way, a conservative way, a moderate way, an artistic way? Tell us about the tone of the source. Tell us about the intended response. How are we supposed to react to the source? And this looks at not only the problem that inspired the source, but again, the solution. You know, if we can see the, the tone, if we can see the appeal to the viewer, then through that we might be able to unpack a solution. And the solution is the perspective, because that's how they would like to change society uh, towards their goal. And their goal is their ultimate ideology, right? Should reflect their ideology. So if, if it is a cartoon, is there a character which is an exaggeration or a distortion of a person or object uh, with the goal of providing a comic effect? So typically there is, right? So within political cartoons, look for exaggerations, look at distortions, look at connections. There's got to be some personification or symbolism or irony within that cartoon that allows you to unpack that nuance as to what is this cartoon about and how do they want us to respond to it. Also consider symbols within the cartoon. So if there's a cartoon and uh, there's a boat and the flag of the boat is the money sign instead of the U.S. flag, that's probably for a reason. Also by looking at when the cartoon or the visual is from, we can consider context. You know, why was the source created? You know, why was the source created? Um, one of the ways to unpack that is to understand, you know what, this source is not created in isolation. There are events that happened after the source that inspired it, and there's events that the source creator is hoping to happen. Sorry, there's events that happened before the source that inspired it, and there's events that will happen after the source. The hope of the, the source creator is that they can shape those events. So what happened before the source that inspired the source? You know, maybe the source is a cartoon uh, from 1932 America, and it shows people living in poverty. So what's the context? What caused that poverty? And can we connect the context to liberalism? Maybe the need for liberalism to evolve, or maybe the fact that liberalism is not viable. Most often, you can look around the immediate vicinity of the primary focus of the source, of the cartoon, of the photo, to find what is being described. This is usually an illusion or an indirect reference to a past or current event that isn't explicitly made clear within the cartoon. So if you can't see within the cartoon, you know, what is the event that inspired this? Look around for some hints. There should be some kind of illusion or indirect reference that we can infer that the source is a response to something. What section of the population is the publication geared towards? And in, in what country or locality? So another way to look at a source looking at the audience is to say, okay, is this source created in America? And who within America, the United States of America, is meant to look at this source and respond to it? 
Um, and how will they respond? So if the source is being critical of Trump's policy, is it a source that is being created before an election? And is the intended response for the uh, electorate to reconsider their choice for president? Um, you know, by looking at who it's geared towards will help us to figure out what is the intended response. Now, a photograph uh, is usually accompanied with some kind of uh, source. In this case, the photo that we had for Source 3, we show the Westboro Church protesting. Uh, that's a civil liberty of theirs in the United States. That's part of the First Amendment. In Canada, we would call the, the freedom to protest one of our fundamental rights in the Canadian Charter. But they're protesting at the funeral of Tim McLean, who was beheaded on Greyhound bus, going from Edmonton to Winnipeg, July 30th, 2008. So there may be a reference, uh, like a tagline at the bottom of the of the photo that explains you know, when it's from, where it's from, or if it's the diploma exam, go back to the work cited or, or the reference page at the end you know, the, and, and see you know, what exactly, where exactly were those sources from. So I just happen to have the June 19 um, diploma here and we've got some sources within it. And if you go to the back page, there's a credits page and it gives you a little bit more information about where those sources are from. So. Look in the vicinity of a cartoon, look for a tagline for a photo, look toward the credits page at the back as well. So how can you discover the ideological perspective intended? Well, being that the third source is a protest, and the protest was at a funeral, and that the protesters are using their civil liberty to proclaim to the victim that the victim and, and others are going to hell, it isn't too much of a leap to assume that somebody might use this photograph Right? How would they use the photograph to explore, to defend, to further what perspective, right? What perspective would they use this photograph to explore given the circumstances surrounding the photo? So given the circumstances surrounding this photo, what agenda, what perspective would be furthered by someone saying, this is what I think about it? So you look at the photo and you're like, what kind of what kind of emotional response would people have to that photo? Well, Maybe we need to limit civil liberties. Therefore, the source rejects liberalism or at least insists or initiates a discussion about to what extent or whether or not liberties are absolute. Because here we have some circumstances where many, many individuals within our society would say, that's not a good time to be protesting. Now, there's, there's people mourning across the street. Um, you know, they have the right to protest, they have the right to assemble, but maybe they should exercise those rights um, in a different time and place. That this is not an appropriate time. That um, in a John Stuart Mill kind of way, there's harm being done. You know, through their expression of their liberty, they're, they're harming others. They're harming the mourners across the street. So also you can look for other related ideas. This is a chance to attach other ideas to the source. This is where you can try to use other philosophy or other evidence to further the perspective of the source. So how would someone further the perspective? So taking what's there, how would someone add to what's there to continue this perspective, right? That is the ideological perspective of the source. So um, step four, this is a chance to attach other ideas to the source. In, the, in this case, the case of source three, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is not directly shown, but it's a very relevant addition to a discussion of what's happening. So even though the charter is not shown there directly, we can discuss the connection with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And because it is an American uh, church, we can talk about the Bill of Rights and we can talk about fundamental rights and we can talk about the First Amendment. And there it is. One could also add only to highlight the intended source, not to overpower it, but one could also add connections to related philosophers like John Stuart Mill, who would suggest that harm is being done, and therefore it is in the best interest in a utilitarian way to, uh, to limit you know, the power of the Westboro Baptist Church to exercise their First Amendment rights. Um, we can do this to add support and further the perspective, but don't do this to become tangential and become distracted and suddenly make it all about Hobbes. Because if you suddenly tell a story of the philosopher or tell a story of those who would support it, are you still talking about the source or have you tangentially drifted from the source? 
don't drift from the source. Talk about the source. So do use philosophy and you know discuss those who might support it, those who would continue the 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 ideological perspective presented, but don't become distracted by this step. Next step, well, you repeat these steps for each of the sources. And then, ultimately, after you have a um, paragraph for each source individually, you create a fourth paragraph for the relationships. So most students in the province, um, they, they don't have an intro, and they do the relationship in a separate paragraph. So it really becomes a four-paragraph paper, and uh, one paragraph per source, paragraph one, two, and three, and then the fourth paragraph is their relationship paragraph. So now that we've analyzed each source individually, now that we've interpreted each source individually, the next step is to look at them as a set. So now you have three sources, and you have to look at them and say, okay, what do these guys have in common? I have an orange, I have a banana, and I have an apple. Oh, man, it's about fruit, right? So you have three sources, and all three of them should be seen now as a set. And as a set, they share things in common, like they should each be addressing a common question, a common inquiry. They should each be able to answer a common, what I would call an umbrella question, a hypothetical to what extent question. To what extent is it in the best interest of the state to restrict civil liberties during times of crisis? That's an example of a to what extent question, an umbrella question, that three sources as a set now might be giving three possible ideological perspectives as answers. So there will be some reoccurring uh, umbrella questions. You know, what should be the relationship between the government and the governed? You know, what is the nature of mankind? So there are some um, umbrella questions, but by the end of Social 30, you should have enough practice with them that you can anticipate the types of common themes that hold the three sources together as a set. You know, what's a theme that they all share? What's a, what's a problem that they're all identifying as society? You know, what, are, what kind of comment are they making about our relationship with each other and our relationship with government? So there's lots of things there, but we have to have something that holds them together as a set. If we just jump into, you know, source one and source two and contrast that, Contrasting the sources is an excellent step, but on its own, it's a very limiting step. If you only contrast the sources, you're going to get a 40%. So what we need you to do is more than just contrast the sources. We need you to say as a set, this is what they have in common. And that's why proposing a hypothetical question can be very helpful. The three sources should have one or more relationships in common. You need to identify these relationships. One simple way is to begin to see them as a set. Once you identify the relationship, we need to explain this relationship. So if you say, like, this is a to what extent question, should the government restrict individual rights in times of crisis with regards to this question, source one would suggest this. In response to this question, source two would say this. In response to this question, source three would say this. But then after you do that, have them respond to each other. What would the uh, cartoonist from one say to the photographer from three? You know, would they agree? Are there some assumptions that the photographer in three has made that the cartoonist is uncomfortable with making? Is there a continuance of ideological perspectives? Do they continue each other? There's, or do they contrast each other? Um, what would they say to the ideological perspective from source two? From the quote, from the writer in, in two, from the voice behind source two. The cartoonist in source one, how would they respond to the, to the ideological perspective suggested as a solution to the problem in two? Do they agree? Chances are they have to have something that they might disagree about. They're not going to present three sources that have identical ideological perspectives. So there should be some kind of nuance, some kind of element where they would suddenly disagree. Final step, now that we know the general theme of the source, do the ideological perspectives agree? Um, how might the presenters of each respond to each other, refute each other, res uh, would they support each other, right? We can also look at cause and effect relationships. Because this thing happened in source one, does that cause the thing to happen in source two? Is there a chronological cause and effect relationship? And maybe the cause and effect relationship looks at the evolution of liberalism. 
that you know because of the stock market crash because of the greed in source one we see the stock market crash in two and then we see the the creation of modern liberalism through FDR's new deal in source three now chances are they won't have it in one two three order it might be that the greed is in three the crash is in one and FDR is in two they're going to change it up a little bit, make it a little less obvious, but there's probably a cause and effect chronological relationship happening as well. You might be able to suggest in, in the relationship paragraph that two or more sources have a similar tone or similar context. Maybe they're both dealing with the civil rights movement in America. Uh, maybe they have a similar medium or intended audience or intended response, intended solution, intended ideological perspective, right? You know, do they have the same dream, but maybe different paths to get there? That's just a reminder of how you get marked on it. And this is where this Prezi used to end. And there's a sample um, site there to see some more A1s from Albert Ed. And this was like a final checklist. But as you can see, I've added a lot to this. So checklist, just some things to think about. Have you done these things? But then I decided, you know what? Let's use more. Let's use more sources. Let's go and give my students more sources, more practice. So here's another source. Freedom has enslaved many of our socialist brothers. Distracted by the placebo of democracy, capitalism is the terminal disease used by the few to exploit the many. It is therefore our responsibility to resist America and her clones and liberate the hearts and minds of our imprisoned brothers from the relentless tide of Western imperialism. This is a call to arms. If we fail, the world will become an empty shell. All of its resources used in the blind pursuit of individual glory killing the collective. So uh, don't bother Googling that. I wrote that. That's why there's probably tons of uh, grammatical errors in it. You might be reading that and say, man, that comma is meant to be a semicolon. Well, get over it. Commas and semicolons. I made a mistake. So there's the uh, source. And let's break it on down. Identify the issue, the problem, the challenge that the source is a response to. So what is the issue, the problem, the challenge that this source is talking about? The paradoxical enslavement caused by freedom. This is Orwellian speak. Freedom is slavery. The term slave has a negative connotation. There's going to be some spelling mistakes. Uh, people do not willingly deserve or desire to become a slave. So you can use the language of the source. You can break down the language of the source to become more sophisticated and precise about finding the ideological perspective. So breaking down the language of this source, we can get to this. The idea of the paradoxical enslavement caused by freedom. The Orwellian idea that freedom is slavery. And this is significant. So another way to unpack a source is talk about, you know, what's the significance here? You know, what would happen if we don't address the problem in the source? You know, the source is exposing a problem in society. If left unaddressed, how bad would the problem make our world? So the significance of this issue is because the victims of said enslavement are our brothers. And we have a familiar responsibility to protect the integrity of our brothers. If our brothers fall, we might be next. First, they came for them, and not, nobody said anything when they came for me, right? So um, there's this idea because of the language of the source. They're creating a, a familiar connection, a re responsibility, a relationship that these are our brothers. So by using the term brothers, we can see the significance of the issue. We have to address this because their integrity is our integrity. If nobody defends them, nobody will defend us. We have a responsibility to help them. They are my brothers. And we have a, a, family, a family responsibility. How big is the issue? So do we need to solve the issue? How big is this issue? So again, looking at the language within the source, um, it says things like, unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. The relentless tide of Western imperialism, right? The term, the relentless tide of Western imperialism, allows us to explore how big of a problem the problem that inspired the source is. This phrase, not phrases, this phrase links and parallels what is happening today with the foreign policy of imperialism. 
The same policy that will forever be linked with the raping, the looting of the New World of Africa and Asia. Imperialism led to the 19th century genocide of the Congonese people, a genocide committed in the name of the selfish pursuit of profit from rubber. So they use the word imperialism, and with the word imperialism comes this whole um, unpacking of history, right? And because there's all this negative history connected with the word imperialism, connecting uh, Western ideology with the word imperialism and with the legacies of imperialism, um, it really does further their perspective, makes it more clear that the Western foreign policies are the equivalent, the modern day equivalent of raping and looting of the new world of Africa and Asia. So we look back at the imperialism of the age of empires and uh, we're disgusted by what happened. And the source is suggesting, well, the same thing's happening today. It's happening in the sweatshops in China. It's happening through the IMF and the WTO and the World Bank. And, and it's happening through the instruments of transnationals. We have new generals. The generals now are American corporations and corporate interests. And instead of, you know, battling us on the battlefield, they're taking our hearts and minds um, as they're making us into their clones through capitalism, through wanting us to become... Uh, American to basically adopt the American dream and, and become you know blindless consumers that uh, it's our love of Americana that will uh, make their ideology become ours and enforce that assimilation is inaction an option can we be neutral in this conflict so another way to explore the significance of the source is to say okay what if we don't do anything, right? Is inaction an option? And it says right in the source, if we fail, the world will become an empty shell. All of its resources used in the blind pursuit of individual glory, killing the collective. So very dramatic, right? So no, no, we can't be inactive. Very dramatic, you know, I'm a dramatic person at times. Um, very dramatic, very, very absolute, right? If we fail, we'll kill the collective, right? There's no middle ground here. It's an absolute statement. It's going gonna, it's gonna to kill the earth at a, at a natural level. It's going to destroy the resources, leave an empty shell. So there's an ecological, um, we can in, infer there's an ecological connection here. But we can also talk about killing the collective is, is a social statement. It's killing, it's killing humanity on, on a social level. So no, the earth itself is at risk. The ecological impact of individualism is not sustainable. It's nonsensical and can only be supported by those blind to the impact of their actions. Unfortunately, there's a lot of evidence to support this claim. Climate change, species extinction, and non-renewable resource exhaustion becoming the most alarming. This is all that related issue three of social tech comes back. When we talk about the sustainability and viability of globalism, we're actually really talking about the sustainability and bio viability of liberalism because globalism is defined economically as a world free market. And there's more to the cost of inaction. If we fail, if we fail, the world will become an empty shell. The cost isn't just physical. There is a moral emptiness, right? We will become an empty shell is the cost of enslavement. We will be left empty, empty of morality, empty of ethics, right? It's, it's a, there's a moral uh, war being fought. And we'll become like others. We'll be clones of America. Again, paradoxically, we stand to lose our individualism. If we adopt American individualism, we will lose our individualism. It's a paradox. If we take the placebo, if we take the pill from America, a clone is not a desirable identity. So they use the word clone because we should, as a reader, we should have a response to the word clone and we should be like, I don't want to be a clone. Well, that's what they're intended to do. Because it, we'd be basically someone else's identity. Now, maybe you're like, well, man, I'd like to be X person's identity, right? There's probably lots of people that have great lives. That's not the point that they're making. Their point is that you're losing your free will. And don't forget that the freedom is linked with being a terminal disease. So even though we're losing our free will, this is why it's a paradox, that the freedom that is the placebo that America is giving us is actually a terminal disease. So how has this been possible? Democracy is a placebo, a false cure. We believe that it is a medicine to help us, but the reality is it's only serving to 
distract us. That was bad acting. So elections are not really free. Uh, choice is an illusion. In America, you have two main uh, viable parties. In Canada, we have more than that. But really, really, I mean, Andrew Scheer is guilty of, uh, of scandalous behavior and, and ec economic uh, embezzlement. Uh, Trudeau, he's had more scandals than... Uh, most politicians, he's like Teflon Don, nothing sticks to him, but um, they're both individuals with the same kind of character flaws, right? So the idea is that, you know, choice is an illusion. There's not a lot to separate some of these major political parties, their platforms, the candidates have become puppets of something else, corporate agendas, right? So elections give the exploited a false sense of inclusion. So because America and Canada could be argued as being... Um, like uh, facades of, of a real democracy, right? They're not true democracies, it's just a facade. Or actually a plutocracy or a corptocracy, ruled by the rich or ruled by corporations, and therefore our politicians don't represent the will of the 99%, they represent the will of the 1% who have the power to better lobby them and to better influence them through campaign finances and through you know trips to secret islands. Um, well, that's why this whole idea of Democracy being sold is a false cure. It's a placebo. It's there to distract us. The real game here is capitalism, and sadly our hearts and minds have been lost to the reality that we are being controlled, exploited for another's gain. That Within this game of capitalism, the 99% are losing, but they're more excited about the next iPhone than they are excited about the fact that uh, relative to others, our lives are getting worse. It's time to wake up from the matrix. So who might agree with the perspective? Chomsky, Marx, Rousseau. That's why having a cast of characters is important, starting at the beginning of the course, so that you can connect ideology to statements. That there's parts of this source that look very Marxist. There's parts of the source when it talks about the malaise of modernity and the um, competition and jealousy that private property unleashes. That's Rousseau. And, and Chomsky's an angry leftist as well, so we definitely have three individuals who would agree with the source. Um, so what would be their prescribed solutions? What would Marx say? In response to the source, what would Marx's solution be? The role of the revolutionary, break off the chains of oppression, unite with the workers of the world, protect our common interests, end the exploit, exploitation due to individual initiative, stop the class warfare that's only serving the 1%, get rid of the system that has been set up to perpetuate the, uh, the exploitation of the 99 by the 1%. That's what Karl Marx would say, and that is being echoed by the sentiment or the ideological perspective within the source. Rousseau? Private property, jealousy, malaise of modernity, his solution, we need public property. And you see how I'm connecting it also to uh, ideas within liberalism? So Chomsky, as it was in pre-revolutionary France, the power is in the awakened hearts and minds of the masses, the 99%, who must act individually and collectively to destroy the institutions of this new old regime Change the eco economic, socio-political game from exploitation and competition to one of compassion and cooperation. How do you do this? You look to Gandhi for inspiration. And you look to um, Gandhi when he says, be the change you want to see in the world. So has this ever worked? Maybe the 1930s in Catalonia. Um, might be a good uh, starting place to see if it's ever worked. Will there be resistance? Of course, the hearts and minds of those 1% will be um, um, basically the, the main level of opposition, but there'll also be the need to um, re, I don't want to use the word like indoctrinate, um, re-educate, re-educate the hearts and minds of those that should be angry so that they can have the epiphany as well. So that's why Marx suggested there would be a dictatorship of the proletariat so that the um, re-education of those that were most um, victimized by the previous regime would, would end up seeing it. So how do you overcome this? Marx would use violence. Maybe Gandhi would use civil disobedience that is inviolent. So nonviolent civil disobedience by Gandhi is different than Marx's violence. So in summary, this is a rejection of Smith's invisible hand, 
It's a rejection of the lack of government regulation to protect the interests of the many from the abuses of the powerful few. In the least, the government needs to not be a puppet to the interests of the few. They need to create legislation to protect consumers and workers, and they must limit the corrupting influence of capitalism both domestically and abroad because there's a foreign policy part of this, right? There's the idea that we have a responsibility to our brothers. Maybe our brothers live in Guatemala or Nicaragua or Honduras or El Salvador. So we, we must come to the aid of our, of our brothers elsewhere. Brotherhood isn't a nationhood. Brotherhood is, you know, commonality and class is the main brotherhood that we have. You know, we have an economic reality that we share. So these are some steps that we did. So step one, interpret each source, explain the ideological perspective presented, and discuss the links between the principles of liberalism in each source, right? Step one, what's on the page? Why is it on the page? What's the problem in society? What's the goal being presented there? What are the values of the goal? How does it connect to liberalism? What, how do the values of the goal can connect to uh, non-liberalism? So the state determines all, this is a new source, um, we're going to practice again. The state determines all that is morally, socially, and materially valuable. Therefore, it is the right and obligation to monopolize all power and authority controlling all aspects of society. The state functions as the protector of citizens, providing them with identities, welfare, and security in return for loyalty and obedience. No rights or freedom should exist apart from service to the state. Individuals and groups constitute one unified, integral whole, working towards common goals. Thus, any notion that liberalism functions for the greater good is naive. Great source. Really summarizes statism, uh, really summarizes collectivism. Um, and again, in essays, you can borrow some of this language. So not only are you practicing how to do an A1, many of the steps we're doing right now, it's the same steps for breaking down the source in an intro to an essay, and then some of these ideological perspectives you're being shown here, they could be the arguments that you you end up using in the body of your essay. So if you wanted to do a, an essay where you're pro-collectivism, uh, there it is. Good luck. Good luck. It's very clear, very convincing, but now you need to find some evidence to further that, and there's evidence out there. So we need to elaborate on key phrases of the source by adding a discussion of philosophy, related concepts, and an application of evidence. So when it says, the state, right, it begins. The state determines, right? So when it says the state, as opposed to what? The state as opposed to individuals? As opposed to families? As opposed to the church? So what is being said, the state determines, tells us their ideological perspective. By saying the state and not by saying the church, or instead of saying the family or saying individuals on their own, it's showing us the ideological perspective. The state determines all that is morally valuable. For example, this applies in Italy's Germany, where Mussolini says, you know, uh, everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. So again, there's these, there's these uh, quotes that seem to be fitting a lot. This is also an example in Nazi Germany, where indoctrination was used to alter the population's morals, uh, socially engineer, right, ethically engineer them concerning issues like euthanasia and genocide. The state determines all that is socially valuable, right? So it says the state determines all that is morally valuable. We see that in Nazi Germany. All that is socially valuable, we see that in Brave New World. The state uses breeding and conditioning programs to separate the people into classes so that we have social value. We have alphas, we have betas, and we have others, right? <laughs> Omegas and other Greek letters. I should have, you know, spent more time at frat houses. Um, once separated, the uh, state even controlled the nature of social interactions by establishing social norms like a lack of true intimacy in Brave New World. So Huxley talked about social engineering, right? 
So Huxley describes a dystopia because the state tried to determine all that was socially valuable. So because the state determined what was socially valuable, and because individuals like Bernard didn't, then it was a dystopia for Bernard, and spoiler alert, he hangs himself because of it. And you were going to read the book. Oops. The state determines all that is materially valuable. Again, in Nazi Germany, the state created the Volkswagen as a way to motivate the workers to focus on the potential reward of future consumerism. It is the right. So in the source, when it says it is the right, the ironic and juxtaposed use of it is the right seems to, be, seems to imply that the source is in response to a discussion about rights. So when the source says, it is the right, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Are you in an argument right now about rights? Are you in a discussion about rights? Perhaps it serves as a response to a pro-liberalism rant about individual rights and freedoms. The term obligation further highlights the absolute stance of the source. Obligations are not negotiable. One cannot argue against what is obligated. Former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln is remembered as being obligated to tell the truth. This characteristic de defined his presidency and his legacy. How absolute is the position? It furthers the argument by clearly stating to monopolize all power and authority. This is a clear rejection of the core liberal principle of accountability of government and seems to reflect a Hobsonian, right? A, a Leviathan-like relationship. A Leviathan-esque, Hobsonian-inspired relationship between the government and the governed. Sometimes I just like making words up. This is not exclusively a political or economic source, as the voice quoted then claims the source should control all aspects of society. The source seems to support the collective principle of the state putting the common good ahead of individual interests. Although this practice had some sort of or short-term success as Stalin used central planning to rapidly industrialize and save the Soviet Union from his prophesized crushing from the other great powers, in the long term, the absolute nature of totalitarianism soured in the hearts and minds of the Soviet citizens. In Nazi Germany, the state introduced Gleichschalt tone um, and achieved, at least until their defeat during World War II, complete control and coordination of all aspects of society, from the economy to the media, culture, and education. This idea of having unity towards state goals is furthered in the second last sentence, where it is proclaimed that individuals and groups constitute one unified integral whole working towards common goals. The source seems to attempt to justify their socio-economic and political monopoly by proclaiming itself the protector of citizens. So you use language to sell your perspective. We're the protectors. Sure, we're going to control a lot, but we're doing it for you. We do it for you. We're the protectors. A common propaganda tactic of authoritarians. In fact, the idea of being a protector indirectly suggests the president's the presence of something to protect from, an enemy or enemies of the state. Perhaps scapegoats like the German Jewish people were used, their presence was used to justify the overall need for adherence to collective norms, state enforced collective norms, that really uh, highlight social and political collectivism. The idea of adherence to collective norms is furthered by the claim that the state will provide the citizens with identities. Imagine if Trudeau gets to define who you are. Again, objectors might see parallels with imprisoned dystopias like Huxley's Brave New World, where the state did in fact engineer your life at a genetic level before birth and a social level after birth. This sentiment was championed in Italy during the 20th century when Mussolini said, oh, within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. The continual bargaining of the source is returned to, as the source suggests, that in return for loyalty and service, submission, to the state, the state will provide welfare and security for the people. You're obedient to me, I'll give you this Serb check. I, I mean, welfare check. I, I mean, security. Um, this might be meant to persuade the audience that there will be benefits to their relationship. Don't question state policy. Here's a little bit of money. 
Perhaps the state has either created or responded to an immediate threat to national security, similar to Hitler's use of the Reichstag fire to proclaim the need for emergency decrees. The use of the term welfare is interesting because in its essence of the main argument for economic collectivism, that there will be some economic equality. This may include a generous and even enviable network of universal health care and education. But for a liberal, an economic liberal, like Milton Friedman or Anne Rand, the cost is clear. If we allow the state to interfere in our economic lives, our political and social and economic liberty will be lost. But it appears that the state is taking a big brother-like approach, suggesting that freedom is slavery. And therefore, when we submit to the state, only when we submit to the state, we will be free. And there are people like Sorrell that said that it's by submitting to the state that our lives will have purpose. And that's what's being shown here is that genteel Sorrell, Schopenhauer-like idea. The true danger of the source is in the phrase loyalty and obedience. It truly conjures images of an unaccountable tyranny capable of the most heinous crimes. It was loyalty and obedience that poisoned the hearts and minds of average German citizens and convinced them that being a gas chamber attendant was an acceptable, moral, and maybe honorable role within society. Again, the absolute and unbending nature of the source is announced when it claims that no rights should exist. More than just serving as an ideological counter-revolution against the Renaissance, this is in fact eliminates any possibility of individualism within the state. No rights should exist. This is an absolute statement. The message remains unchanged, that freedom is only possible within the state. When one applies this logic to the Canadian Charter, and we can truly illustrate the dystopian nature of this prescribed state, no freedoms of movement, no freedom of association, speech, religion, apart from the state. So you can speak if it serves the state. You can practice your religion if it serves the state. You can have associations if they serve the state. You can move freely as long as your free movement serves the interests of the state. Under this scenario, all citizens would be in a metaphorical nationwide prison. Perhaps the closest thing that we have in 2017 when I wrote this, 2020 when I'm talking now, who knows what year when you're, when you're watching it, would be the failed and nightmarish state of North Korea. The absolute attack on liberalism is summarized and concluded when the statement suggests that it would be naive to consider liberalism as a path to the greater good. Although many socialists would agree, more moderate socialists would be alarmed by the unbending and extreme form of authoritarianism that this source prescribes. So, then I got another source. What do we do with cartoons? So here's a cartoon that... Um, I've showed my class, usually. I think it's been on an old diploma. It sure looks familiar. I'm pretty sure it was on one of the first diplomas. In, I want to say it was on the diploma in 2011, in January. I may be making that up. Um, so with cartoons, you have a number of tools to find and interpret the perspective. Identify the visual elements. Take a look at the cartoon as a whole. Make note of the drawings you see. Make a list of the visual elements, including people, animals, other objects. Look at the setting. Find the portion of the cartoon that most stands out. Often it's a character, an exaggeration, a distortion that's used for comic, comedic effect. Understand labeling. So there's labeling here, right? You got labeling. You got B, citizens class B, right? And these are B's, and, and these are B's, and you got curfews for A's, B's, and C's, and they're different times. And here's the police, and that's a pretty big police vehicle. And we have a camera that says, for your protection. That labeling is significant, right? That the ideological perspective is unpacked by nuances within the source. And the nuances within this cartoon, we've got A's and B's separate. We've got segregation. Um, it becomes clear when you look at the labeling. Labeling's key. So, exaggerations, obviously that military uh, vehicle hopefully is exaggerated as well. Uh, labeling, um, yeah. 
So Source 2 is a political cartoon that has in the foreground two B citizens appearing unsettled. Unsettled, look at my language, as they sit on a bench surrounded by various and sometimes intimidating symbols of state control. I don't know why I'm speaking like that. The characterization and division of the citizens seems to present a rigid society similar to apartheid South Africa or segregation era America. The main difference might be that even those B citizens that enjoy special privileges seem to be caught in an outlandish relationship with their government. Outlandish. Look at the text bubbles. People in a cartoon will often speak to each other in the cartoon. Huh, weird. Alternatively, they will think and there might be a thought bubble. Read what people are saying or thinking in the cartoon. The despair of the citizens is captured as one turns the other and, and rations. Well, um, rationalizes, I guess. Well, at least we don't have to worry about anarchy anymore. This may offer some insight into the events preceding the cartoon. Perhaps the citizens used to face the threat of anarchy, and they requested the state to seize some control. The citizens may be characterized uh, based on their potential threat to state security. Therefore, we have A, Bs, and Cs, right? Uh, under this scenario, it would be the will of the people to sacrifice the principles of individualism in order to enjoy collectivism. This is, as Franklin suggested, a fallacy as those who in moments of weakness sacrifice freedom, even temporarily for security, deserve neither. Pay attention to how the visual elements interact with each other. Think about how different symbols are drawn in relation to each other. Is there some kind of juxtaposition? Understand analogy. The cartoonist may compare two things that are not alike. This, tactic, this technique may be used if there is a complex topic or idea that is difficult to understand. By comparing it to something else, it can be easier for the cartoon to understand. The cartoon juxtaposition. I'm making words up here that I can't pronounce. It, it, contrasts, uh, it contrasts the familiar with the non-familiar. In the foreground, we have the familiar, two citizens sitting on a bench. That's relatable. We can be like, you know what? I've seen benches. I know benches. Benches exist in my world. That's familiar. But for surrounding the citizens in a familiar setting with unfamiliar symbols of state oppression, we now we become attached to the source. We become a part of the problem and hopefully connected to the solution. Recognize exaggeration. Artists will use um, opportunities to exaggerate, distort certain elements to further their perspective. Uh, often it's facial features or body features, or it could be exaggerating uh, people or animals um, in, in a way to further their perspective. Uh, understand symbolism. An artist may use symbols as placeholders for ideas or themes. Imagine using language like you know, the, the money sign shown on the flag in the cartoon is a symbol used as a placeholder for showing the um, celebration of economic liberalism. And in this case, how worshipping that or being patriotic to that ideology will lead people into uh, a battle that they cannot win. You know, a battle with, with tremendous casualties. Imagine using placeholder um, in your writing. That would be nice. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. That would be like a, hmm. Somebody said placeholder. That's nice to see. That that symbol is a placeholder for something. I see the symbol and I say, you know what? That symbol is more than just a symbol. It's a placeholder for an ideology. And with the ideology, whole other nuance to the source. When we consider the totality of the instruments of state control, the cameras, the curfews, the segregation, and what appears to be a completely unnecessary and excessive display of police might, it also becomes likely that this scenario may not represent the will of the people, you know, after all. But rather, the citizen's words may simply be his parroting uh, of state propaganda used to justify their authoritarianism in light of a fictional threat from anarchist scapegoats. This would parallel Hitler's use of the Jewish people, Stalin's fear of the kulaks, and Big Brother's perpetual war with one of the other two global superpowers. Nailed it! Look at minor details. Often the cartoon will have minor details that contribute to the humor or the point of the cartoon. Pictorial symbols convey minor themes or ideas. 
These are usually found in the background or sides of a cartoon. The government's justification for the law and order is shown as the CCTV, the closed caption television, is labeled for your protection. The rejection and despair of the citizens is furthered as they are shown either without faces and individuality or looking hopelessly at the ground. Their lack of individual identity is similar to those interned in death camps by the Nazi Germans. The, there, there too, uh, the inmates learned that they should avoid making eye contact with the representatives of the state as that could be grounds for their murder. Look for allusions to contemporary events. Some cartoons will link the subject to, to current events, right? So uh, in, in 2020, uh, we could say, well, there's anarchy in the streets of America, and some people do want the police to set curfews and, and to bring in a show of force to you know, return America back to normal. So that's a current event that would connect to this cartoon that I wrote about in 17 that I think we looked at in like 2011 on the diploma. So the most concerning element of this cartoon is that the context is in Nazi Germany, but could be America of the future. During the modern era defined by the global war against Islamic Jihadism, many liberal states have abandoned some of their founding principles in order to gain greater security. In this way, the cartoon services Orwell's 1984 did as a warning that totalitarianism could infect even the most liberal of nations. The issue of privacy, the Fourth Amendment, from the intrusive nature of government is clearly symbolized with the excessive police presence. It is worth noting that many have seen the USA Patriot Act as a first step in the U.S. towards illiberalism, and now under President Trump, many are suggesting that democracy in the USA could be replaced under the threat of national security. Well, he hasn't done it. There have been many opportunities for Trump to do it this summer of 2020, and he hasn't. Um... Maybe you're watching this in the future and, and you're like, just wait, buddy. He's about to. Well, I don't think he will. I don't think he will. Look for stereotypes. Some of the visual elements may be stereotypes. This might help the reader identify the visual elements more clearly. This can also call attention to the stereotypes as offensive and outdated. The hard power, the hard power displayed by the state, right? The hard power of the state, that, that big police vehicle. Um, the hard power displayed by the state seems stereotypical, as most governments are more sophisticated at creating control now. They give, you know, free money to control you uh, by creating control, shown in the cartoon, by through the more deceptive soft power of indoctrination. The soft power instead of hard power. We don't need boots in the streets. So that's hard power. We need to control your hearts and minds. That's soft power. If you control their hearts and minds, perhaps by creating a cult of personality or more likely the illusion of participation and choice, then the tanks are not necessary. Identify the people involved in the cartoon. To give you more reference points, find out the names and roles of the people involved uh, with the issue or event. Use of satire, the use of humor and irony and exaggeration and ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity, stupidity and vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other issues. Recognize irony. Irony is almost always there. Identify the perspectives of this issue. The issue at hand will have different perspectives. The characters within the cartoon may or not have contrasting perspectives. So within the cartoon, you have the cartoonist perspective, but you have the people's perspective sitting on that bench. You have perspectives that you could infer that citizens A, B, and C have based upon their uh, different um, um, relationship that they're allowed to have, and maybe the perspective of the cop guy sitting in that big old tank-like thing in the back. Determine the artist's perspective. The way that the artist drew the scenario, is it in a way that I would want to live there? If yes, the artist probably is promoting something. If no, the artist is probably rejecting something. Determine the audience. A political cartoon is created with consideration to the experiences and assumptions of the intended audience. What section of the population is the publication geared towards? If we accept the possibility that this represents an Orwellian-esque warning, then the audience may be citizens that are currently living in a liberal state, but seem to be oblivious or even apathetic to the vulnerability of the state becoming a facade. Identify objectives that... Uh, Identify adjectives that describe the emotions in the cartoon. 
the words and pictures together will produce certain meanings. Many political cartoons are intended to portray some emotions. What emotions are being portrayed in the source? What emotional response are we meant to have to the source? Identify the audience, the intended response. Uh, this cartoon could be used to promote grassroots active citizenship in an attempt to maintain the legitimacy of liberal states. Imagine saying that in, in uh, like an A1. This cartoon uh, could be used to promote grassroots active citizenship in an attempt to maintain the legitimacy of liberal states. Sure sounds like an E sentence. Here's another cartoon. So, um, there we go. We've got comedic effect, understanding labeling, and then it's going to tell you about them. I'm going to let you maybe come back and, and, and read through this. Understand analogy, recognize exaggeration, because I do want to get to do, 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 the relationship paragraph. So I'm going to let you look at how to break down that cartoon um, by coming back to my Prezi. And this is a way to get more people to look at my Prezi. That's only going to make me look to be more um, important. And it's all about my ego. So um, let's, let's take a look at the relationships. So, by looking at relationships, we can look for overarching themes. So, in Social 30-1, there are some predictable overarching themes. The role of citizens, the role of government, the responsibility of citizens, the responsibility of government, the poss and possibly the need for a state. You know, why do we need government? Uh, politically, socially, economically, why do we need a state? Why do we need a government? What is the nature of citizens? Can citizens exist independent of the state? What is the nature of government? Can government be or is it a benevolent entity? Or even under certain circumstances, is there a need to provide security? Will government be tyrannical? Um, is there a fear of anarchy? These are possible themes of this set that um, could be unlocked. Another possible theme is the evolution of liberalism. Rather than representing an evolution of liberalism, this chronological understanding of the sources uh, would represent the devolution of liberalism towards collectivism. So rather than saying, you know, liberal liberalism uh, is evolving here, you could say we're drifting away from liberalism, that we're losing that cornerstone of individualism and we're adopting a cornerstone of collectivism. It's a paradigm shift. You can have responses to each other. With regards to these issues, how would the voice quoted in Source 1 respond to the cartoonist from 2? The cartoonist seems to be overemphasizing the role of force and intimidation and ignores the true liberating quality of content that the individuals would feel cloaked by and with the government. So, Source 1 says, you know, the people in Source 2 would feel all warm and cloaked by the freedom of their government by having curfews and police there. It's like, I'm safe under this cloak of government. Um, wow, that's quite the, quite the terminology. Um, cartoonist from Source 3. The cartoonist seems to understand that the need for government and the simplicity of the anarchist perspective. The reality is that the danger exposed in Source 3, including the concept of people suffering disillusions, is still present as long as there is any individualism in society. How would the cartoonists from 2 respond to the cartoonists from, from Source 3? They might argue that the anarchist state is not ideal. So an assumption um, is you know, about an anarchist state, and, and they may be saying um, an anarchist state is not ideal, but there remains room for at least a discussion between the two cartoonists as to what the role of government should be. The cartoonist from 2 seems to highlight the fall of collectivism due to our violent natures, while the cartoonist in 3 seems to highlight the fall of individualism due to our violent nature. So they agree that we are by nature violent, but they are focusing on the fall of, of different ideological systems because of our violence. The cartoonist in 2 is exposing the tragedy of what is more uh, liberal state than one prescribed in Source 1. Um, therefore, it is safe to assume that the one prescribed in one would be a worst-case scenario for the cartoonist. So, the 
cartoon in Source 2 is showing a state in a very tragic, flawed, dystopian way, but the one that's prescribed in one would be even worse. So that's a relationship. That's a, a linear relationship that the cartoonist is very alarmed about the circumstances around two, but would be even more alarmed by one. One's even worse. That would be even a worst case scenario. And we got a whole big long thing of quotes and sources and things there for you to think about. We've got a, another source. This is a photograph. So I wanted to include a photograph. This was in the news um, last fall, so fall of 2019. Um, just one morning, we had the um, hashtag bridge out, hashtag bridge out movement. And uh, here, the Walterdale Bridge in Edmonton was uh, blocked by some some protesters uh, and and yeah there's there's a whole lot going on in this photo so we need to be able to break photographs down too so I included a photograph and I included some descriptors here to inspire you so in this case the group protesting are an environmental activist group called the Extinction Rebellion Edmonton it says right that in the source. I, I saw a little a little picture of that. Based on what we can infer, ah, I use the word infer. Based upon what we can infer, that those protesting are concerned about the collective good, specifically the environmental price of economic liberalism. This connects to Chapter Twelve of Social Thirty One, but also much of related Issue Three of Social Ten One. Terms that could be mentioned when you unpack this source would include climate change, climate chaos, the age of stupid, the death of birth, ecological footprints, sustainability of this paradigm, the you know viability of our biosphere, biospheric detoxification, consumerism, desertification, all of these great things, right? Looking at the context, it is easy to link the source to one of the overall themes of Social 31, the struggle between individualism, economic self-interest, and collectivism, the common good of having a clean and sustainable biosphere. Another nuance of the source is that it also connects to political liberalism. The actions of the activists and the impact it has on the motorists exposes the struggle between the competing interests of political individualism, that's the protest, that's the activism, in this case, the fundamental uh, freedoms of speech, protest, assembly, and the freedom of movement of the motorists. So you have political individualism. You have two groups that their expression of their individualism is actually at odds with each other. The protest, the freedom of, of speech and protest and assembly is blocking the freedom of movement of others. And it's during a morning commute. And there were doctors that uh, were... You know, we're very angry and they're saying, you know what, I may agree with what you're saying, but I do not agree with how you're saying it. I had a client on the other side of the river I had to get to, and because of your protest, I didn't get to my client. That you need to think about the consequences of your actions. And this is an illegal demonstration at a very inconvenient time. But environmentalists would say, well, you know, the true inconvenient truth is the cost of our lives on the environment. See what I did there with Inconvenient Truth? Like, I've never even watched the video. Continuing our connection to liberalism, one can also begin to explore the division of society that surrounds the issue of problem that the source is exposing. Here, proponents of authoritarianism might use this scenario to further the argument that democracies are prone to divisive conflict and that under strong leadership, the irrational and often conflicting will of the divided masses could be ignored. The state, like Stalin did in the 1930s, could harness the full potential of the nation to address those potentially fatal challenges within society. Obviously, proponents of liberalism might suggest that the protest is a sign of a healthy state that allows dissent. Further proponents of economic liberalism might add that under capitalism, we are more likely to see the creative intelligence of potential problem solvers unleashed. Historically, the adherence to collective planning and unrealistic quotas stifled the creative thinking that we need to address this issue. This paragraph? You should be able to apply that paragraph to almost any A1. That's a brilliant paragraph. 
After you explore the context in this source, the problem that inspired the source, you can explore the significance of the source. Hypothesize what might happen if the problem is not addressed. How dystopian or flawed might our futures become? In this case, that gives you an opportunity to bring in some of your science background about animal extinction, habitat destruction. After you explore the significance of the problem, you can continue the division of society that you uh, may have started when you connected the source to liberalism. Who might support the actions of the activists? Who might oppose them? Offer reasons why. For example, the context being Edmonton could inspire you to relate this protest to a greater economic and political struggle between those who support industries that may have a negative impact on the environment like the oil and natural gas industry and those who might not. The timing of the source, 19, sorry, 2019, the timing of the source during a federal election should also inspire you to point out that Canada was divided nationally and remains so to an extent that some in the West are contemplating separatism over this very issue, the struggle between the industry and the economy against the environment. It's good to be specific here. Have names like Al Gore and quotes by Al Gore at the ready. The assignment is about interpreting an ideological perspective. Key to this will be to clearly state what is the solution to the problem that's being presented. This is a photo. So within that, within a photo, there will be multiple perspectives. The protesters have a solution in mind and with that values and assumptions about man's nature and values and assumptions about our relationship with each other and our relationship with the state. But there's also another group, the motorists, that may be off camera or may be um, just minimally at, at the margins of, of, of the photo. How might they feel? And, and a third party here was the photographer who decided, you know what, I could point my lens here, but I'm going to point it here instead. You know, a photographer has an agenda as they decide where to shoot and where not to shoot what to emphasize in their frame and what not to emphasize. So the photographer is showing a bias. So by showing the activists and making them look united and powerful, he or she, the photographer, um, is, is showing a, a pro-activist bias. Had the photographer flipped the camera around and shown the frustration of the motorists, then it's a totally different perspective. With a visual, it's always important to look for more details to further impact the context. Here, you might want to consider the boat. Activists use it to symbolize the rising oceans due to climate change. That we are all in a boat together is purposefully communicated on it. This could be a reminder that the problem cannot be ignored or escaped, and it will need a collective effort to solve. Also on the boat, such as this one, we will be all relatively equal as socioeconomic uh, privileges don't transfer well to traveling by canoe. The bridge literally is a testimony to man's intellect used to conquer nature, but in this case, by blocking the bridge, hashtag bridge out, the activists are demonstrating how inconvenient, life-changing it will be when we lose control over the environment due to climate chaos. It is a reminder that the marvels of man may be temporary. The link why are their arms linked together by metal? Is this to expose how unnatural the modern world is? Bum, bum, bum. Other elements within the source include things like the tagline underneath that includes the detail that it was an illegal protest. So reminding you it's an illegal um, furthers a perspective. This shows that the student, this allows the students an opportunity to discuss the role of the police and the responsibility the police have to the protesters who are breaking the law, and the motorists. And we've seen a lot of that this summer. Other details that you may have known about the source, that what this wasn't an isolated protest. You could also talk about how uh, those in Edmonton coordinated their protest with people around the world. Um, elsewhere, some were arrested. So what does that say about the Edmonton police who didn't arrest, but rather negotiated for a resolution? And... That's the last one I'm going to do with you here, but I'm going to add more. I'm going to add more. I'm going to add more to this Prezi because it's only 119 slides long at the moment. Why not make it longer? And it only took me like almost an hour and a half to go through it. So I'm going to add some more because I have some more that I could add. And ultimately, the goal here is that you will have enough exposure to me breaking sources down that uh, 
you'll understand how to break down sources. I'll see you on YouTube.